Sorry today, now that you don't have to see a purple screen, actually on the way over here, I made a note on my phone to buy a new adapter when I get back, but uh, clearly didn't buy it yet, but luckily plenty of you have this problem of needing adapters because your stupid laptop doesn't have all the connectors you need. It's really fun. Okay, uh, any questions before we start on the homework or projects? Homework one, project two. No questions? So you want harder homeworks and harder projects? Easier. Easier? Well, you don't have any questions, which means that it must be going fine. And I only had one person in office hours yesterday, which also means it's going fine, right? Sure. Are you in office hours again after class right after nope. today? No? Okay. Uh, whenever it's on my schedule. Uh, the TA has office hours today. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they're on the website. I think all five days a week we have office hours. I think he has Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I have Tuesday, Thursday. So, you know, this is why you need to start early, right? Because if you have any problems after Friday, you're going to be on the homework. You're going to be kind of on your own until Saturday. Um, you know, I may, maybe your other students will help you out. Maybe I can help you out. But really, this is why, you, you know, you got to start doing things early so that way we can answer all questions and, and help you out and make sure you're successful. Cool. All right. So this is where we left off, right? So. Oh, I, uh, did I do this wrong? Right, so what? Oh, no. I burned everything. Okay. So what do we, so let's try to recap and get us back to where we were. So what, what do we call these, these things that I've written here? Or some of the terminology here that we've been using? What is it? Production. Production, yeah, they're production rules. Production rules of what? Tokens. Context-free grammar. Yeah, exactly. A grammar, right? A context, specifically a context-free grammar. So what does context-free mean? Doesn't have context. Yes, very good. How did you come to that conclusion? Genius? Popped in your head? Yes, very good. Yeah, so the idea is the difference between context-free and not context-free grammars it has to do with the thing on the left. So the idea is if we, I don't know, if we maybe chose a different rule depending on where S was, if S was here or if S was here, maybe S isn't the best definition. Um, something like that. So this would be where the rule we choose is dependent on the context that S appears in. Uh, so depending on the context, we would choose different rules. But we're talking about context-free grammar, so we actually don't even have to worry about that. Know that that's what it is. It is kind of weird to talk about something as being free of context without understanding what it means to have context, right? Um, okay, so then, so I want to find out a possible string that this can generate. So what, what kind of, what, what do I do to try to create one of those strings? You pick a rule to start with. Pick a rule to start with. Yeah. So I start with e, right? So I start with the starting. Non -term, the starting non-terminal, which in this case is E. Right? I choose a rule. So choose a rule between 1 and 2. E times E. Right. E times E. E, you say times? Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to write a times symbol than it is. That's why I was letting you get it out of the way early. Sweet. Now you just have to write okay. it every single time. Now, now what do we do? Now you apply choosing a rule to each of the e's on the other side. So choose an e. Which e? Say, take this e. This e. First e, and let's go with e plus e. Great. So we'll do e plus e times e. Something like that. Mm -hmm. It's really bad today. Weird. Maybe it's because of cold. I'll blame it on that. <laughs> okay. And let's choose another e. What if we choose? Let's choose the middle e. Let's take that to a number, let's say. We have e plus num times e. Uh, and then which one? Let's just make them all numbers. So we'll do it step by step. We'll do e uh, plus num times num. And then we'll do num plus num times num. Right? Seems simple enough. So what did we just do? What did we just, 
what's this process called? Substitution. No. <laughs> good guess. That's a good app description, I guess, of what's happening. D word, it starts with a D. Derivation. Derivation, yeah, we're deriving, right? We're deriving a string a string that's in the language described by the context-free grammar by starting with a starting non-terminal and simply applying one of these production rules over and over again until we end up with all terminal symbols here in our resulting string. Cool. All right, so what are the different types of derivations that we've talked about? Leftmost, rightmost? So is this a leftmost derivation? No. No, no why not? We, we started in the <coughs> left and then we went in the middle. <coughs> and then we went to the this right. This step here? So it's not a leftmost derivation, it's a rightmost derivation? No, 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 because we started off. It's a derivation. Right, yeah. So this is just an example that a derivation doesn't have to be either leftmost or rightmost. It can be neither. Yeah. In in you know in programming languages, do they choose one or the other, mm. or is it does it flip flop, or does it or does it do both at the same time? That's a very good question. We're gonna come back to that. So derivations to me are actually a little bit easier to understand for humans, right? So it's pretty easy to see exactly what things, what rules were chosen at each step. Um, programming languages, though want to do the reverse, right, essentially. A programming language doesn't start with a non-terminal, right, doesn't start with the starting non-terminal. The programming language, when we get in, our compiler gets in a sequence of tokens, right? So it's actually starting here at the string and trying to go backwards, in essence. Um, but we need to know how to do this to understand how can we generate strings. So if I say, so you know, if we want to answer the question, hey, is num plus <coughs> star num, uh, does that exist in the language described by, let's say, that context for grammar G? Does it? No, because it's not possible to derive that string applying the rules, starting with the starting on terminal and applying those rules. Yeah, so it definitely doesn't apply. Uh, but yeah, hold that thought. We'll come back to that. Okay, because the idea is, right, order. Um, we actually want, what we really want is we want to think about it in terms of parse trees uh, because if we go back to what we talked about the, when we started all this, uh, we said, okay, our lexer gets in bytes, right? Bytes. And the lexer using tokens, which are defined using regular expressions, is able to group, essentially group those uh, random bytes into tokens. And then that sequence of tokens is fed into the parser which then is going to create a parse tree from that. If we'll look at a parse tree. All right. So let's let's change our language a bit. I'm kind of tired of that example. Uh, let's see. A goes to. A, B, or a C, and B goes to little b. All right, what does bar mean? Or, or. Or, so how do we read that, that rule? Big A equals A, capital B, or C. Yeah, so it's essentially two rules, right? So there's two rules there. A can either go to, A can produce little a, big A, or A can produce little c. That's little c. Okay. So we can quickly do a fast derivation here, right? We can go S goes to, we only have one choice, right? Uh, small a, big A. And then we have, uh, we can expand, let's just expand A to C. So we have A, C, right? And then we're done, that's a string that's in our grammar. Okay, let's try to think about how can we represent this derivation in a different way? How can we, represent that in a different form. So let's think about, let's start at S, right? Let's think about a tree. So what, what's the, what are the important properties of a tree? Branches. Branches. Parents and children. Parents and children. So you have basically what, nodes? Connected to nodes. 
and edges. Yeah, nodes and edges. Uh, you can't have any cycles. That's going to go from the top down, right? We usually have a root. So the root of our tree, well, it makes sense to think we're starting from the starting non-terminal S. Right? And then let's apply S goes to A, little a, big A. So what would my children of S be? Little a is one. <coughs> Yeah, why? Because little a is a terminal, and so that's going to end up being a leaf. And big a is going to end up being a node, and so more children that come out of it for each other. Yeah, so, you know, we're just applying this rule. Exactly. We're applying s, and we say s can be turned into little a, big a. Right? And then we say, so are we done here? Is this a complete tree? Does it represent the string that this s could possibly generate? <coughs> Why not? Because A can also be A, B, or C. Exactly, right? Because we have because we have a leaf. What does a leaf in a tree mean? Falls uh, to the ground and you can write poetry about it. <laughs> it's the end. It's the last. It has no children. Last node. Exactly. The yeah. node that has no children. But here, well, this A, we said S can be something, so we represent that something as its children. Here, A can be something. So let's choose, let's do the same example. So let's choose, um, the rule A goes to S. So what would the child of A be? C. A, B. C. Yeah, I said S, R but you're correct. S. So can I expand this out? Nope. Can I expand this out? So then, once I have this tree structure, right, that represents that represents my derivation here, now what happens if I take all the leaves and concatenate them together in order? I get the string, yeah, I get the string AC that's in the, that is the string that's generated by this grammar. So, can I do it again? Let's see. So, let's draw another tree. So, do I have any choice here? No. No. So, how many children is the S node going to have? Little a. <coughs> and I write it like this? No. Why? Because A comes first. Little A comes first, second comes first. Technically you can as long as you're like consistent about it being right. backwards. <laughs> uh, I, I guess. That's what you're saying. I like, guess as long as I'm constantly wrong all the time. <laughs> if you just take the opposite and not whatever I do, then I'm right all the time. Um, okay. I, yes. Okay. Theoretically, yes, you could if we were drawing trees like this, but it doesn't make sense intuitively, right? Because at the end, we want to take all the leaves and go left to right, right, as they appear in the tree, and to be able to create that string. Uh, Unless you come from a culture that reads right to left. Which we do not. <laughs> I mean, maybe you do. It's totally cool, um, obviously. But we, as a culture speaking English right now, as the dominant language that I'm teaching you in, we're going to go left to right. That way there's no question. All right, A goes to, so let's choose a different uh, rule here, right? So how, how many children would I give A? Two. Two. What's the left child? The right child? Big B. Big B. Big B. Am I done? Nope. Big, Big B is going to be not a terminal. So then what's the string here? A B. F. G. Um. Great. Let's look at it with expressions. It's very quickly. Uh, and hopefully this will show some of the benefits of, uh, you know, I'm going to be, I'm just going to call this a dot. That's a lot better. Uh, and I'm also going to get rid of num because num is too many words, so I'll just do one. <laughs> All right, we'll start at E. Now let's apply one of these. So how many children is E going to have if I choose rule one? Three. Three. Three? Why three? Do the tiebreaker. Because the plus is going to be one. Right. Because the plus.
plus is a terminal in this language, right? It's a symbol in the language. <coughs> so the left child is going to be an E, right? What's the middle child going to be? The plus. And the right child? The E. Awesome. OK. Let's expand this out by applying rule two. So how many children is this E going to have? Do I expand this? Does this have any children? Nope. Why not? Because it's a plus sign. It's a terminal. Terminal. It's a terminal. terminal. Yes, it's terminal. And exactly. Also. Okay. So think about a tree, right? Does the order that I add children on here make any difference to the final tree? Nope. No, right? So when I'm done. So when do I know when I'm done first? When, when you your have all leaves are terminals. terminals. When all leaves are terminals, yeah. So I know I'm done when all leaves are terminals. Um, so then I can decide, okay, let's create this one. So what's this going to go to? Well, let's stop. So let's say this goes to one. So how many children is it going to have? One. 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 With the number one. All right. Let's just do this one. One. And this one. Great. So. How many derivations can we do that results in a string here, 1 times 1 plus 1? So this we can easily see, right? This is the resulting string. Yes. Oop. Fine. Right? So the string that this represents is 1 dot 1 plus 1. How many derivations are there of that string? I can, I can see at least two. At least two. Yeah, you can do a leftmost derivation or rightmost derivation. I think we also showed that you can do it uh, with neither, right? So there's probably at least three, maybe more. Uh, probably a lot more, depending on which way, if you switch. When you get to two E's at each point, you can choose one way to the left or one way to the right. Um, are there any other ways to write this tree? Well, that way. The, our current context-free grammar doesn't have a way of doesn't have a, a way of representing grouping, uh, like parentheses, brackets, curly braces. So there's not really a in order of operation. Ah, so yes, okay, that's definitely true. We're gonna hold that. We're gonna get to that. Uh, I think today. Um, the key thing I want to point out here is that there are multiple derivations of this string, right? But there's only a few ways we can do, like you can do a leftmost derivation and a rightmost derivation, and both of them are going to be the same tree, right? So you could, so if we start with this, we can say, okay, we start with E, right? Then we apply E plus E, right? And leftmost, which one am I going to apply? <coughs> uh, the one on the left. Oh, the e times E. One on the left? Yeah, yeah so it'll be uh, E dot E plus E. And then we do leftmost, which would be that one. Uh, one times e plus e. <coughs> and we do this again. We'll do the leftmost dot one plus e. And we do this again. And we do finally we get one plus dot one plus one. Right? And we can do the same thing with rightmost, and we'll end up with two different parts, two different derivations, leftmost and rightmost, but one parse tree from that. Look at some more examples. A little easier. It goes by a little quicker. Yeah, so this is our example. So we have the expression. We have expression plus in here. I'm just using a different color for the terminal symbols. Um, and we can expand this out, as we've seen, kind of in whatever way, just as long as at every place, <coughs> just that every leaf in the tree is a terminal symbol, and then we know we're done. We've finished parsing. And obviously, as long as the parent-child relationships respect the rules, right? That was the other thing. OK. Let's look at why we want to use a parse tree. So if I give you, so let's talk about that. Let's get into the, <coughs> this idea of precedent. this dot e and we'll go two and three. So if I asked you
you, so if I say, okay, this is a mathematical equation, right? This tree represents the mathematical formula, uh, some kind of mathematical operations. What would you compute? What, what makes sense to compute? Seven. Well, walk us through. What's, what's the first thing you do? First character is two. Two? Second character is a multiplication sign. Multiplication sign. Third character is a three. And so I would compute those. Okay. Two times three, which is six. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> the math right there, right? And then plus one, I have to do this in front of everyone, so it's really terrible. That's why I like you guys to do it. Okay, so six plus one. What about what if I wrote the tree like this? First thing, right? Is this a parse tree? Yes. Right. At each layer, we're applying one of the rules. Um, all the leaf nodes are starting are uh, terminals, right? Verify. Yes. Terminal. 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 Uh, is it the same string? So, what's the string that this that both of these trees represent? Yeah, the tree looks a lot different though, right? <coughs> so if you're going to compute this tree and use this tree to perform the operations, how would you do it? What kind of information is essentially encoded in this tree? It's 3 plus 1 times 2 instead of, excuse me, 8 instead of 7. Why 3 plus 1 first? Why are you doing 3 plus 1 first? <coughs> What about the tree? What about the tree? Yeah, the closest character. Yeah, I would say the closest one, the closest operator at the top is the first one. Right. This one? Yes. So two times three plus one. So that has to change. So look at this, right? If we just look at this, uh, this subtree, right, in isolation, would you know how to compute that? Yeah. If I looked at this expression in isolation, this subtree, would you know how to calculate that? Uh, if you look at this subtree in isolation, would you know how to compute that? 3 plus 1, yeah. So then if you look at this whole tree, how would you compute that? So using what we just said. 2, plus, two times 4. So. 2 times the result of 3 plus 1. Yeah. Right. Whereas this one is? The result of 6 plus 1. Exactly. 2 times 3 plus 1. And see, it's encoded in the tree structure. Right. Farther down here, each subtree represents a specific thing. This says, hey, this expression is a 3 plus a 1, right? And this expression is the expression 2 times the expression 3 plus 1. Yeah. So just expanding on this, so mm -hmm. in a parse tree, in a proper parse tree, like down the line, would the parse tree automatically adjust it or control, create itself in a way that it follows order of operations? Ah, yes, we will get into that. Okay. There are lots of ways you can do that. That's kind of cool. Yes, <laughs> it, it is. It's very cool. Yeah, the point is, well, actually, we're going to see grammars in a second. We'll talk about grammars in a bit. But, um, but for now, right, if I, so if I give you either of these trees, you can compute, right? So you can compute whatever expression is, no matter how complicated or how far this thing goes down, right? So this is why the goal of... <coughs> The parser is to take in the string, right? So the parser doesn't get this, right? But the rest of the program sure would like a parse tree because then it can perform some computation, right? It's structured. It's very clear what things are children of other things. All these issues of order of operations or whatever have already been dealt with. So everything else is simplified. So we can say, OK, if I know how to just evaluate an expression, then I can evaluate this tree of expressions because everyone is just I know how to evaluate a sub-expression. Expression is either a single uh, string, or sorry, a single number, or an expression is another expression added to another expression, 
or an expression multiplied by another expression. So the goal of parsing, what we want to do with parsing is our input is this string. Right, so what we know, we know 2 times 3 plus 1. We also know our grammar. Our goal is to create a tree from these, this string, this input string of tokens. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. First right? That's all we want to do here, right? And this is why... Part of the reason why I really like talking about compilers from a software engineering perspective is all these problems are broken down into distinct components that each do one thing. So the lexer just gets tokens from the bytes, right? But it's cool because it uses regular expressions and it uses all the regular expression and language theory stuff here. And here when we're doing parsing, we take the input as those series of tokens and then we're gonna create this tree out of them uh, using the context-free grammar and all those types of things. So, um, yeah, our goal, we want to get to that parse tree. Um, and so parsing is essentially determining either the derivation, but really, really derivations are for us to think about trying to understand how these grammars work. Uh, really, our end goal is we want a parse tree because as we've seen, right, we can compute something on it. We can compute. All right, there's two major parsing problems, right? So one is the thing we've just seen, right? If the grammar that we just defined, if we had two times plus one, there's two possible parse trees that could be generated from that, equally valid based on our context-free grammar, right? The other one, what else, what else do we care about a lot of times with uh, programs or parts of, you know, this is something your compiler, your interpreter, right, is something you use every single day. Every time you compile, or if it's an interpreter, every time you interpret and execute your program, right, it's running and going through all these steps. So do you want it to be super slow? Would you be super stoked if it took like a day to compile your code? Would you ever finish your projects? No. Or you'd learn how to be a much better programmer, I guess. Or maybe you'd... <laughs> Move into hardware because I talk to hardware people, and that's what they say is the big problem: is you like design this whole thing, you get to it, and you're like, oh, it doesn't work. Now we have to go back and change things. So we want it to be efficient. So these are the two problems and the two questions we're going to ask ourselves to drive why. Why does it work like this? How does it work like this? What kind of things can we pull from the grammar? Can we do some kind of cheats? Are is do we want to accept every context-free grammar and be able to parse it? Uh, are there some way we can winnow that down so that we're only thinking about efficient uh, grammars, grammars that are, we're able to efficiently parse? <coughs> okay. So we looked at ambiguity, right? So this is the, pretty much the exact same example. Right? So here's two derivations, each with different, uh, uh, different uh, strings. So this is, this is the definition of an ambiguous grammar. So uh, an ambiguous grammar means that there are either two leftmost or two rightmost derivations or two parse trees. All those things are equivalent. Um, so you can take a leftmost derivation, you can turn it into a rightmost derivation, you can take either of those and turn them into a parse tree. So just like we looked at, right? Right? Both of these trees represent that string, 1 plus 2 times 3. When we're thinking about execution, right, and we're thinking about interpreting that, that tree, what does the tree on the left compute? 1 plus 2 times 3. Which is? 3 times 3, 9. 9? And what about the tree on the right? Somebody else. 7. What was it? Seven? <coughs> two times three and then plus one. Two times three, six plus one, seven? Yeah, exactly, right? But because of the way our language is written, both of these parse trees are valid for that string, right? If you only have that string, trying to derive both, you could derive either of these parse trees. Okay, so a formal definition, right, is if there exists two different leftmost derivations or two different rightmost derivations, or two different parse trees for any string in the grammar. So is English ambiguous? Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I would say absolutely. <laughs> there, there, there. <laughs> there, there, and there. Can, can. Uh, so if you think about written English, right? That's extremely. That's uh, I don't remember the word for it, but it's when words sound the same. It would be ambiguous uh, yeah, verbally or auto, auditorily. Yeah, he, he, he got it right. Homophone. Homophone. That's what it is. Yeah. Sweet. That's good. Um, what about just grammar-wise? Well, I mean, the sentence is, has some things that it's supposed to contain: subject, a verb. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's all these exceptions. Is the problem? Rules and exceptions. Yeah, that's really huge for us. So is this is this sentence ambiguous? Yes. yes. <laughs> Saw a man on a hill with a telescope. Seems pretty straightforward, right? What's the straightforward <laughs> interpretation? Says, you saw the telescope. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm there. I'm off the hill. I saw a man on a hill with a telescope. With my telescope, I use my telescope to see the man. But on the, the hill. question is, does the man have a telescope or does the hill have a telescope? Why is that a question? Because the commas are placed. <laughs> <laughs> I saw right, so what's, what, are, what are the other interpretations? Let's go through this. I like this exercise. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I saw the man on a hill with a telescope. So you saw him? You're <laughs> sawing him in half? That's the yeah. first one you went to? <laughs> 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 with the telescope. With the telescope. You break it in half to maybe get a little jagged edge so to help you with your sawing <laughs> endeavors. It's not in the center. <laughs> it's not in the sentence. Yes, very true. What else? Yeah. Could be like you're on a hill looking at someone, or you're looking at a man on a hill. Yeah, so like you could be on the hill. I saw a man while I was on the hill with the telescope. Mm -hmm. Right? What else? Come over here. It's a fun game. Yeah. Right there. Um, uh, you could see the man on the hill and he has a telescope. Yeah, right? That's, and that, does that change the definition? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it changes the idea you're trying to convey. Just like if I were to tell uh, the computer 1 plus 2 times 3, and it gave back uh, 9 instead of 7, right? That completely changes everything. Yeah. You see a man on a hill, and the hill has a giant telescope. The, maybe the hill has a telescope. Maybe the hill is a telescope somehow or something, right? It's like a secret evil lair, and that's like a <laughs> telescope coming out of the hill. Is there anything else? We could go back to the, uh, you know, and you can all do all kinds of combinations, right? We can go back to the actually sawing a person in half. Like you're sawing them in half, and the man has a telescope. He's like holding on to it for dear life. Or you saw right? Yeah. Or you, or you saw him with the telescope. Yeah, exactly. So or you're sawing him on it with a saw on a hill that has. Yes, also that, that option as well. <laughs> or you're sawing him with the telescope. Yeah, you have to break it in half or something. Don't anybody go out and saw anybody with a telescope, please. <laughs> I feel like that's not a tool for job. Uh, <laughs> Alright, we're going to leave the Dexter ideas for later. Alright, so do we want this in a programming language? No. Why not? Because for that exact reason, you never know what you're actually trying to convey to the computer. Right? Yes, yeah, this is why natural language processing is so difficult, and it's such, we're just now kind of making strides in that direction, but does stupid Siri understand me all the time? Absolutely not. No, or Cortana, or whatever the thing is, right? Like, it frequently misunderstands you, or uh, gets, and that's audio, right? But even text parsing, that kind of stuff, right? But, you know, we're not talking about that, we're talking about programming, so what, what why don't you want that in your programming language? What's so special about programming? We do it, right? We're humans. I think society's kind of functioned fairly well with us speaking this ambiguous language. I guess, like, unfortunately, a computer isn't really as versatile. It's like, you know, you understand what you, you know, contextually, things like that. So. Yeah, so part of what I can do, right, what we can do, right, when I make, like, a joke about Dexter or something, right? I'm using our shared cultural knowledge, and I'm assuming that you'll be able to know what I mean or infer what I mean based on uh, you know, our context and our common sense and our shared experiences. Yeah, <coughs> and language kind of leaves all that out. It would be, 
I don't, I don't know, if you think about communicating with a human as if without any ambiguity, go crazy, right? And it probably would have no jokes. <coughs> or maybe it would be funny because you're explaining the jokes. Right. What else? Is that the only reason why? You don't want the computer deciding, well, what does the programmer mean today? You want repeatability and get the same result every time. Yeah, so what if you compiled it today, and then tomorrow the computer decides, I, I actually think they meant something else, so I'll <laughs> compile it differently. You also want to have to take your time to verify what you mean. Yeah, right? So think about like the compiler every time it's like, oh, did you mean this or this? <laughs> 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 Uh, I guess that would be, I don't even know if that's, I don't know if that's worse than it just deciding or. <laughs> What's going to be the option to choose? Yeah, you yeah, probably have to choose a lot. Yeah, so basically, right, we don't want the compiler to have to try to read our minds, right? I think somebody briefly mentioned that, you know, the, the, the computer is fundamentally stupid, right? It's a stupid butler that can do things very, 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 very fast, much faster than we can. Right? But it only does exactly what we tell it to do. Right? So remember that when you're working on projects and it doesn't work and you're trying to pull out your hair, why? Right? It's only doing what you told it to do. Or actually, it's more like you and the thousands and thousands of other programmers that went into all layers of the computing stack between you and the CPU. But still, it's mostly you. Let's think about, we'll, get, we'll deal with the ambiguity stuff uh, a little bit later. Okay. So we have a string A, B, 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 B. Right? So now we're the parser. We have this input string. Remember really, it's not really a string, it's a sequence of tokens, but you can represent a sequence of tokens as a string, right? Um, so I want to turn this into a parse tree. How do I do that? What are some ways you could think about trying to do that? Yeah? See if one of the rules, if one of the characters you have is only one way to get it, so like with that little a um, at the beginning, we can only get that through s. That's the only way that we're going to get it, that little right a. Yeah. But how would we create that into a tree? What would what would we do? You know that uh, one of the yeah, that's not going to help you a whole lot. Okay. It can help, but it's not going to get yeah. it. Yeah. Right. End goal tree. Yeah. So we can start at the leaves, so what does that mean? So we get here, kind of how would that work, do you think? Get here and say, okay, it's got to be, so yeah, essentially kind of what you're saying is we can start something like this, right? These as, as nodes. What's the easy way, right? So on a programming interview, usually when they ask you a question, your first thought should be, What's the stupidest, simplest way to solve this problem? What's the stupidest, simplest way to answer the question or to create a parse tree from this? What's usually the stupidest, simplest way? Brute force. Brute force. How would you brute force this? Just try every possible solution. Yeah. Until one right. Yeah. Load up these rules, start generating and cranking out parse trees until you get a parse tree that matches this, and then you found Job done. the string, right? Job done. Yeah. You know. And oftentimes, you know, in the real world, those solutions really work because you only have 10 things to iterate over. So it doesn't matter that your solution isn't doing it in log n, right? It just matters that you're actually doing something that's correct that does what it needs to do, right? So the first thing, that's what you could do, right? You just, let's, we know how to, we know how to create parse trees from the grammar, right? We just choose rules and we can iterate over all possible strings. What's the downside there? It's time computationally expensive. Yeah. Computationally expensive, it may never finish. How do you decide that you're actually exploring all of the space? It could be the very last string that you find. And it's clearly, what is it? it violates one of our properties we want from our parser, right? Fast. 
fast, efficient. Exactly. Cool. All right. So now we're looking at the leaves, right? Can we build the tree from this leaves? Yes. Yeah. So how do we do that? Do it. Start with the very last bee. I want to make that one into a bee. You want to make this one into a bee? How do you know to do that though? Because why, why magic. You use it's the only way you can get to it. Because of magic. Because of magic. All right, let's go down magic. I'm gonna erase your magic. Let's look at this A, right? We can look at this A. A can only be gotten from the big S, so it has to go up to a big S. Yeah, so there's only one way to produce an A here. Only one way to get to it. Right? And that's if its parent is an S. And if its parent is an S, then what does that mean about its sibling? It has to be an uppercase A. has to be an uppercase A, exactly. So then what do we know about this little B? So we've so we've started we've found S right. So what does that mean about our tree and all the nodes <coughs> in this tree from S? They're all children of S. They all have to be so first they all have to be children of S, right? We start from the start, right? Every <coughs> node in our tree has to be a child of S. And we look here and we say, okay, well, this A. So all the rest of the nodes in this tree must be a child of that A, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing else here possible in this tree, right? There's no other nodes in this tree that we know about. We know that for this, for this string to actually, for this uh, parse tree to generate a string that starts with A, the first thing has, to, and the first thing has to be a small A, then everything else has to be Bs. Um, so then, what's what would be maybe the next rule after this, or how can we connect this? Big A to the small B. Well, big A can be little B, big B. So there's your first little B. Right. The second, especially because A only has one child, yeah. one potential. Yeah, one potential. <laughs> that makes perfect more sense. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it it has to be. Yeah. Right? We don't have a choice. There's no or there. Whenever we see an A, it has to be a little B and a big B. So what if this had been, what if this had been an A? Then we have been S O L. Yeah. Right? We'd say this doesn't parse. There's no possible way that we could generate a, a string, a parse tree, from this input string. Now, this B, what could be the children of this B? Little, little B, B and another big, 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 big B. Why not? Why? What about this? Can we do that? Yeah, because because it's it's not not to <laughs> Bang, we're done. We're not done here. We just do this. Go home. No, no because we still have two extra Bs. No, because we still have more class. That's why you can't go home. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All right. So yeah. So we can choose this one. We can go little b and big b here. And then for this one, which one do I choose? We do the exact same thing over. The exact same thing over again. And now what about for this one? Just little b. Little b. Yeah. I don't like that tree. I don't like that tree either. And I, but I don't want to redraw it. Is the problem. <laughs> if you think about it, if you pull the s up. You'll get a better tree. Everything will kind of fall out a little bit better. Maybe someday one of you can create some software so that as I write this tree, I can like drag them and move them, and so that way it knows that it's nodes and it will know the length between them. So then I can just drag it and move the tree, and it will do that. I should do that at some point. That's cool. I'm fairly certain that already exists somewhere. It's probably a JS library. Hmm. Ah, but as I write it, that's the thing. I want it to interpret and understand my writing, and as I create this tree, then be able to move it and treat it as one object. Yeah, I know people, there's actually some people that do it on whiteboards, which is super cool. Uh, guy knew at UC Santa Barbara was doing that, where he would record, like, camera record this, and then as you're drawing it, you could draw, like, an NFA or a DFA, like an automata, and then it would... Um, understand that and interpret it and then you could have press a play button to start the automata and it would like move throughout it and parse strings and all that kind of stuff. Just anyways, neither here nor there, but very cool. Okay, so here we kind of started, so in this approach, right, we kind of started from, I'm gonna make a terrible joke, right? So on the tree, where, where do we start? We started from the bottom, right? Now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming out. Right? Sorry, I had to do that. Um, thank you. Okay, but we have 
we have this string. What's the other way we could start if we're not starting from the bottom? From the top. From the top. We can start born rich. We know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one thing that we know about a tree? Right? A few things that we know about this tree. Yeah. What was it? We can know how many. We know how many leaf nodes we gotta have. Yeah, exactly. We definitely know that based on our string. We also know what? That has to follow those rules. It has to follow those rules. And so what does that mean about the root of the tree? That it has to be S. It has to be S, right? It has to be our starting non-terminal, right? If I had a parse tree that was this, like B goes to little b, right? Is that something that language can generate? Does this context-free grammar can generate? No. Right? It has to start with S. Exactly. So one way to do it, we could start with S at the top. <coughs> and then we can try to draw down, essentially down the tree to see if we can match our input. So first we can use the fact that we have how many choices for S? <laughs> One, how many choice, well, I guess, okay. We have one choice. We have no choice to make, I guess, right? So we, we have to always be this rule. Whenever we have an S, we have to have a little a and a big A, right? And then what about for this A? How many choices? Just one, right? We can do little b, big b, right? And we can see we've actually started generating non-terminals, right? So we've We've got this A, we've got this B, now we have a choice, right? So now which rule do we choose and why? The question is why, not just what, but why. Big B, little B, so we can get all the Bs. Mm -hmm. little, yeah. big, little B, big B. Right, little B, big B, because we know there's more into this string, right? If this was, for some reason, the last B here, and we tried to look and see, look ahead and say, okay, we're at the end, so it can't be it can't be big B little or little B big B. It has to be little B. So what about this B? So I've parsed up to here. That's that. And now what about this last rule? Can I do this again? Little B big B. Here we have a nice, much nicer tree, right? So the purpose of this is to show that there are different met parsing methods. They all have pros and cons and various strengths. Uh, we saw bottom up, where we started from the leaves and tried to grow the tree up. Um, <coughs> top down parsing is where we start from the starting on terminal, and we're going to try to work our way down, essentially trying to get to the string. Yeah. Is one way more efficient than the other, or? Is it dependent on what you're trying to do? It's dependent on the language. They each have different approaches based on uh, what types of context-free grammars they will efficiently parse. So they have different rules there. Um, so for this, you know, we're trying to learn this stuff. The ideas here are very similar. So we're going to focus exclusively on top-down parsing. So only this is the only thing we're going to uh, talk about. <laughs> And so that there, we'll kill it. And when we come back, we're going to see what techniques we need to develop to actually do this efficiently. And actually, it's really cool. We'll be able to develop some algorithms to look at a context-free grammar and make some claims about it, about what symbols it can generate, what, which will help us in our parsing.